Jesus is going to return. I bet his return is not going to be like the first time uh, when he came. He's going to return in victory. Revelation 16, 15, Jesus warns, Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Again, Jesus will return to judge. So over and over again, the revelation reminds us to be ready. Amen. Today is part six of the More Than Conquerors series. It's entitled Faithful and True. Now, so far in the revelation, what we've seen, Jesus is with us always. We saw it illustrated in the lampstands. Jesus among the seven lampstands or the seven churches. So that God is in control. We were shown the throne room of heaven. Then we were shown the Lamb who is worthy to open the seals. Then the opening of the seven seals. And we see God's judgment in those upon those who were opposed to Him. But the goal of that was to bring about repentance. Then God is for us. The trumpets. Again, judgment on those who reject God. Those who have the mark of the beast. And all the while, though... God protecting those who belong to Him. Then the woman and the child, starting in chapter 12. And in that story, we're reminded that God is willing to do whatever it takes. That God sends His angels. We learn of Michael the archangel going to battle for us against other spiritual forces. Jesus Himself sacrificing His own life God, again, doing whatever it takes in order for us to be saved and to have a relationship with Him. Last week, we looked at rescued from judgment. God's final judgment, beginning with the bowls being poured out. But again, those who do not have the mark of the beast, protected, rescued from this judgment. In chapter 12, we were introduced to a number of different characters that were opposed to God and opposed to those who follow God. The first of these was a dragon, then a beast out of the sea, a beast from the earth. Today we'll see and be introduced to a great prostitute. And that's how God sees this person. And those with the mark of the beast, we've been introduced to all along. Now, remember the order there, because we're going to see all of these dealt with directly by God, and they'll go in reverse order is what they were introduced to us. So the dragon, the beast of the sea, beast of the earth, the great prostitute, those with the mark of the beast. And then that brings us to chapter 17 for today, verses 1 and 2 of Revelation 17. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. Now, with this symbol and this image that, God, that John is shown, we get to see God's point of view. This is how God sees those who reject Him. They're unfaithful to Him. And so the great prostitute is not just about, it's not a sexual thing, but rather it represents unfaithfulness. And so again, whatever it is that we choose above God or in place of God, if we reject God no matter what it is we turn to, we're unfaithful to Him and we're being faithful to something else. And so the way that God sees us is we're rejecting Him, we're a great prostitute. And that's what's represented here. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Not just sexual sin, but all sin. That's what people are enticed to by this prostitute. Rejecting God and unfaithfulness. Then more detailed description in the verses that follow. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into its desert. 
There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. And so this beast we've been introduced to before. But now we see the great prostitute. She's the woman here. A little bit later in this passage, she'll be referred to as a great city and then named specifically as Babylon. And so all of these are the same character. And so he sees this woman sitting on a scarlet beast. And so red represents evil. The beast we already know is evil. The beast is covered with blasphemous names. It has seven heads and ten horns. And so it's pretty powerful. It's a force to be reckoned with. But at the same time, there's a limit. See, a better way to read it is it only had seven heads and it only had ten horns. Because in a little while, we're going to see somebody that's more powerful than even a beast that has seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. And so in this description that John gives us is he tells us just about everything he possibly can to let us know that this is an enticing, tempting woman. Now again, it's not the woman that we need to take hold of here, but the sin that she represents. And so what may be tempting and enticing to me that pulls me away from God, it may be completely different than it is for you. But the thing that we have in common is it looks good. It looks good to us. We like it. We desire it. We want it. And so again, John describes this. Again, purple, scarlet, glittering with gold, precious stones. She's adorned as much as she can be. And so there's temptation, deception, alluring. She held a golden cup in her hand. And so the outside of the cup looks really, really good. You know, who wouldn't want to drink out of a golden cup? But then you see it's filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. Now, we move on. It's not just that she's sinful, but also we see with this woman, I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Now, easily when we read that verse, we can see that it's persecution is being talked about. And so not only is this woman, this great prostitute, you know, enticing to sin, she's anti-God. She's opposed to God and even to the point of seeking out and destroying what God loves. You know, those who are faithful to him. Now, I want us to consider another interpretation since this is a symbol. Because for many of us, maybe all of us right now, right here in Dumfries or Prince William County or Northern Virginia, we'll call it, we're, we're pretty safe. We're relatively safe from somebody persecuting us and putting us to death because of our faith in Jesus. So we make it read about this great prostitute and think, wow, that's, that sounds pretty bad and it's pretty enticing. And oh yeah, she's, she's treating people, faithful people pretty poorly. And we think, you know, maybe it you know, represents Iran or Afghanistan or Yemen or China or North Korea. And so we think of those faraway places. And so we sort of read about this and it's like, it doesn't really apply to me. And there's not, at least not yet, you know, hopefully it never does. Here's what I want you to consider, though, is that it's not just persecution, but that the church is attacked through deception. So what's going to cause you to lose your faith faster? Somebody showing up telling you, don't believe in Jesus anymore. If you do, you're going to lose everything you've got. You may lose your life. Is that going to cause you to give up your faith? Or is it that one temptation that you're seduced by? And that you are lured to. And that you keep going back to it over and over again. Until ultimately you may sear your relationship with God. And you turn your back on God because you decided you wanted something else more than God. So what's the temptation that you wrestle with? And how often do you give in? How often... Does it win? So again, persecution, I'm safe. But 
still, I think we can be lured in, deceived, enticed by this great prostitute. John goes on, when I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not. Again, we're going to see that again. But that part right there, we think a lot. And we'll see in the next verse. I'll tell you what, I'll wait and tell you then. For now, though, the idea is this beast, it comes and goes. Because remember, this beast, we're talking about governments, anti-God governments. And so there's some in the world today, maybe there's a period in time there weren't any. any. There were definitely some in the past. And so they come and they go. We see God's the one that's in control. He's the one that gives the government its power and its authority. And he's the one that judges. He's the one that brings them to an end or brings them to their knees. And so what we're looking at here is not figuring out who could this be? Which government is this? But rather we see it's not God. It's submissive to God. Or at least it's controlled by God. God is in control. Because anything in this world, no matter how powerful it is, it just comes and goes. It can't even control when it's born and when it dies. So that's not what we need to be concerned with. Then moving on to verse 11, where he finishes up. And will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. Again, reminder, God's in control. Whatever this beast is, whoever it is, whatever country it is, God's the one that's still in control. Then moving on, the beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. Now, first of all, in trying to figure out who the eighth is, and again, you probably go to seminars and you can get books and people will tell you emphatically who it is. Now, again, I think it's symbolism, and so it could represent a number of different times in history. And so nailing down who it is is not the part that's so important. And one other thing to keep in mind is, is a sort of a logical impossibility. Because what you have here is a beast with seven heads. So the beast has seven heads. The seven heads represent seven kings, represent seven kingdoms. And then all of a sudden, there's an eighth one. So it's the beast, and you're saying the beast is the eighth head. And so it's okay if you can't make it work as far as identifying exactly who it is. Again, it was written in symbolism. And so if you can see things that it represents in this world, it just reminds you again, God already knows. God's in control. God's going to win. God has this in his hands. And so this beast, even it's just like an eighth king. It's going to die just like the rest of them. Just like they all came to an end, its end's going to be the same thing. This beast, it comes and it goes. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. Now, here's the coolest part with this passage. Again, this, there's so many things in the series, it's like I just hope I say it right, because I know sometimes I either get excited or get it twisted all around. <laughs> We spend so much time trying to figure out who the seven heads are and who the eighth head is and who the ten kings are here and they're kings but they don't really have a kingdom and, and it's like we start naming off countries and we do all of this stuff and we miss the cool part. So here's the cool part. We're talking about a beast and we're talking about this great prostitute that rides the beast and we're talking about all these kings and all this kingdom and how horrible they look and how evil they are and how opposed to God they are and how much they attack the church. And then in contrast to that, the next thing we see is a lamb. So like on one side you got Goliath and you got David. We know how that went. Or on the one side you've got Egypt the greatest power in the world, and you have Israel, mm -hmm. who are their slaves. Mm -hmm. You have Rome, and all the spiritual or religious leadership of Jerusalem, and you have a lowly carpenter. And every time, who wins? And now in this picture, 
You've got as bad as this world gets. You can gather them all together and put them in the same place and see how big and how horrible and how scary the beast is and how many heads it's got and how many crowns it's got and how much power and how many other kings are following along and how many people with the mark of the beast are following along. And you amass this huge army and then you look across the field and opposed to them, there's a lamb. Now again, if I'm walking up looking at this and I'm going to place a bet, <laughs> I'm not going to bet on the lamb except for there's a catch. This lamb is eternal almighty God. And so the lamb's the one that's going to win. They will make war against the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of lords and king of kings. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. So again, whose side do you want to be on? You want to be on the side that's like, everybody's on that side. That's where all the cool people are. That's where all of the people who have proved God doesn't exist, that's where they are. And then over here, it's a lamb. And then you've got those fanatically faithful people that, you know, that follow after the lamb. But lo and behold, you see who's going to be victorious in this battle. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and those he has called and chosen as his faithful followers. Then verse 15, then the angel said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. So here you go. You got this great prostitute who uses sin and lure and enticement. And lo and behold, it's like, it looks like everybody is on the same side that she's on. So not only all these beasts and all these kings, but all the people in the world, and they're on that side. Then the beast and the ten horns you saw they will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Isn't that exactly how the world is? See, people who aren't in love with God and motivated by honoring God, they can be your closest and best friend until it suits them better not to be. And the world yeah, you know, there's all kinds of alliances that form, and just as soon as the common goal is accomplished, they turn on each other. Yes. And that's how the world operates. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish His purpose by agreeing to give the beast their power to rule until God's words are fulfilled. Once again, all this stuff's happening and unfolding, but it's God the one who's in control of the whole thing. Now, the woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Now, the thing I want you to take note of is we were just introduced to the great prostitute, and now, boom, she's gone. She's judged already by God. Now, we learned a little bit more about who she is, but this woman, she's a city. Again, we can spend a lot of time figuring out which city it is. You know, for John in his day, they would have read this and they said, I know what that is. That's Rome. It'd been easy to pick out. And you go through the course of the last 1900 years and people could look and pick and say, that's a sinful city. And that sinful city has influence on the world. And so maybe we would want to say New York because of the influence that it has. But I don't think it's so much the New York part as I would say media. Maybe a better city is Hollywood. Now, again, a lot of stuff's produced in New York and other places. So Hollywood is sort of like a Babylon, what it represents. And now consider all of the filth and all of the sin that's piped out to the planet from this one city. But the goal here is, again, this woman, this great prostitute, this city, now that we're told, in a moment we're going to see the city's name is Babylon. Again, that's another one just like Rome. We can pick out historically, but it represents sin. It represents fallenness, enticement. It represents rejection of God and His way. It represents, I'm going to do stuff my way. God, yours is nice, but I think mine's better. And that's how we sort of get sucked into this. So if you want, you can pick a literal city, but don't limit this to a city. Chapter 18, 
After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. See, it's over. We just got introduced to her. Here's the great prostitute, this woman, this city, Babylon. These are all one and the same. And we see, you can, you can choose that option. You can fall for it but it's not going to work out. And notice this next part. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. Now, as this voice is speaking, it's talking in past tense. And what this is called is the prophetic perfect. That is when God, when he makes a prophecy, it's perfect. His prophecies, it's as if it's a done deal. And so you can even speak of it in the past tense. It's as good as happening already, is the idea here. And so Babylon, whatever it is, whatever the temptation, whatever it is that entices you, that tries to pull you away from God, don't go for it. It's destruction. It's fallen. And you don't want it. Then John heard another voice. It was coming from heaven, and it said, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. So Christians were still here in the world while this is happening. While she's enticing, while the sin is there, what's our task? To be holy. To separate ourselves away from sin. As this voice says here, come out of her. So separate yourself from the sin. And again, we have to go out among people. That's how we share the gospel. So it's not saying, you know, let's create, let's come to the school and let's all stay in this room and lock ourselves away from everybody in the world. No, we're still called to go and make disciples of all nations. You know, that's still our responsibility. But the sinfulness, the enticement, the things that lead to destruction... Don't share in that. Don't share in her sins. Come out from her. But the world's response, we see in verses 9 and 10, when the kings of the earth committed adultery with her and shared her luxury, see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry. And so there's sadness when, they, when people of the world see the consequences of sin, they're not thrilled with that. They're terrified by that. When God's judgment is evident, it's terrifying. And the next, woe, woe, O great city, O Babylon, city of power. And so sadness and woe is what the world has towards this judgment, towards this hardship. But you notice what's missing? Repentance. They're still not repenting. There's a lesson to be learned, and they're sad because whatever enticed them, it's gone. It's no longer available. They feel woe about it, but it still doesn't bring them to repentance. And in one hour, your doom has come. So no matter how big and powerful it is, the lamb the lamb stronger. Chapter 19. After this I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are His judgments. God's not going to give anybody anything they don't deserve. God is true. God is just. God knows everything. He knows every thought. He knows every action, behavior, every attitude. He knows every heart. God is true and just. And His judgment is true and just. And so we can trust Him. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. Think of the people who lead in places and then their greed so right now, yesterday, it was, I mean, it's almost too hard to watch. 
the humanitarian crisis that's going on in Yemen right now. And people are, just thousands every day are starving to death. And to see little children going through that and just all the pain, and then to see moms sitting there with their children, knowing no hope's coming, no rescue, and watching with every breath because of the malnutrition, the pain, and watching them suffer and die. And the reason for that, one, is the beast out of the sea. Corrupt governments that hate people. They steal everything that they can. Any help that you send, they're going to steal that if they can. And the people that need it, they don't ever get it. But also, the beast out of the earth, the false prophet. And so false teaching that doesn't teach the God of the Bible. And so these two have a stranglehold, and as a result, look at the consequences and all of the suffering. And as it says here, he condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. See, it hurts a lot more than just the people who are sinning. It hurts everybody, especially in circumstances like that. And so the prostitute's going to be dealt with in this way. Sin has messed this world up. Sin causes everybody that we love to die. We die because of sin. And so we need to go to the point that we feel about sin just like God does. We hate it. We don't want any part in it. We want to be separated from it as much as we possibly can. It's what's brought everything bad there is in this creation. Why would we turn back to sin? Why would we continue on with sinning? And then when we read the Revelation and we see what happens to those that choose sin over God, we see the consequences. And not just consequences here, but eternal consequences. Again, why would we give in to sin? Why would we choose to do that? You know, why would Christians ignore God? And continue on with what's enticing to them or what they want to do. Why do we claim things that the Bible says are sin? Why do we claim that they're not sin? You know, I want to do it and I don't want to feel bad about it. Ah, I know. It's not a sin. And so we just erase it as a sin anymore. And so it's guilt free. We can do whatever we want. We pretend like it's not hurting anybody. It's hurting us. We're told to come out, to be faithful. We're here just a little while. This is our engagement period. We're waiting for the groom to come back. We're the bride. That's what we claim when we say that we're Christians. And so we just have to wait. We just have to be faithful to him for a little while. And then he comes back and then we get eternity. So look again at the list of those opposed to God. So you got the dragon, the beast out of the sea, beast out of the earth, the great prostitute, those with the mark of the beast. And so what we've seen, those with the mark of the beast, the bold judgment, the beginning of the end. And so the final judgments, these people are judged by God. The great prostitute hardly didn't get introduced to her very well. And already we see that she is condemned. And what we're going to find is every one of that group is going to meet the same end. They're all going to lose. And they're going to lose at the hands of the Lamb. And so whose side do you want to be on? The Lamb's side or those that are opposed to Him? Then we come back to the good news. So chapter 19, verse 6. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. That's us. We've been invited to the wedding, and not only are we invited, we are the bride, and we've been given fine linen to wear. And if you have your Bible and it's open, you look right there at the end of verse number 8, and it says, Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. So we are claiming to belong to Jesus. He's the groom, we're the bride, and we said, yes, 
We want a relationship with you forever. And we understand, Jesus, that you died and you laid down your life. You suffered. You went through all of that so that we could have this relationship with you. And so, yes, we accept. And he calls us to be faithful till he comes to take us home. Till he comes to take us to the wedding feast. He calls us to be faithful. And so we're in this relationship with Jesus that lasts forever. Why in the world would we be unfaithful and go back to sin or choose whatever sin we're enticed with? Why would we choose that over the bridegroom? What kind of relationship is that? Like, yes, Jesus, I want to be married to you. I want to have a relationship with you that lasts forever. A home you're preparing for me. But the whole time I'm waiting, I'm going to be unfaithful and I'm going to do whatever I want to do. In essence, that's what, we're, again, we slip up in sin. But when we choose to sin and choose to sin over and over again to the point we see our consciences, what kind of relationship is that? So how does Jesus see us? The fourth blessing in Revelation says, Then the angel said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. We see that all through this section here. Judging and truth. Jesus is faithful and true. These words are the true words of God. So we're coming close to the end of the Revelation now. And all the stuff that's been said, all the warnings, all the promises, they are from God. They are true. They will not be deviated from ever. They are God's word. And so we shouldn't hope or pretend or even deceive ourselves of maybe he's going to let me by and not really apply the rules to me. But also the good side of it that we can have confidence and boldness in who, where we stand in our relationship with the Lord. Now, a little side, says, John says, At this I fell at the feet to worship him, talking about the messenger, the angel that was there talking to him. But he said to me, Do not do it. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So again there, he's saying the testimony of Jesus it's God's word. Prophecy is God's word. And so it's truth. You can trust it. But he says, I'm just a servant just like you are. You see, there's a clue there. Whenever you read through the Bible and you see a person of God bow down and worship somebody, and that person says, no, 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 get back up. You know, I'm, I'm a person. I am a messenger. I'm just like you. I'm a created being. Don't worship me. But then when you see, again, we're not talking about Satan or the adversary, but we're talking about somebody from God. But say like in the story of Abraham, when you see the person bow down and worship, and then they don't say, get back up, there's a clue for you that that's God in the story. And so we'll look at that other days. All right, so the messenger says, don't worship me, worship God. Amen. Then here's who you worship. And we have a climactic moment in the Revelation, 1911. And it's just, after reading the Revelation up to this point, it's just like, it, I, even standing here, it gives me chills uh, just to think about and imagine. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. Now, as far as the passage goes, we're stopping there today, and we'll pick back up there next week. But for right now, though, we'll see in the description, this is Jesus. And Jesus is sitting on this horse. Now, again, think about it earlier. You got all the bad guys on one side, and you got a lamb. And the lamb just like, just wins. And it's, there's not even a battle. Just, he wins. Now imagine who we're about to see showing up and standing in opposition to these forces. This rider on the white horse. And if you get an opportunity this week, read the description in Revelation 19 of Jesus. 
and with justice he judges and makes war. But here's the thought I want you to take with you this week. This is not just Jesus at some future point waiting to come riding out on a horse. That's the Jesus who goes with you every day. All powerful, almighty God who fights our battles, who defends, who protects us, who laid down his life already for us. There is nothing in this world that's worth an eternity with a God who loves us like that. And it's scary stuff if you want to pick sin over your relationship with Jesus. So consider this. When Jesus looks at you, he either sees his bride dressed in white, and those fine linen represent righteous acts. It represents being faithful to him. Or he sees a great prostitute who's unfaithful to him. So when Jesus looks at you, what does he see? And he gives us the choice. He's made it possible to be either one of those. And so we get to decide which one he sees when he looks at us. He gave us free will, and he honors that choice. And so it's up to you. He fights for us. And so we just add that to our list here. Of all of the ways to the revelation, Again, the same story repeats over and over again from different angles, but the story's the same every time. Jesus is with us, he cares for us, he protects us, but also he judges those who are opposed to him. And he's going to win, and there's going to be a loser, and you want to be on the side that wins. But it's your choice. So you're ready.